You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, before we get into the sermon, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can approach you and hear what you have said, that we are not left in the darkness that feel around to figure things out for ourselves. I pray as we approach your word, we may do so with open hearts and open minds, that our hearts may be as fertile soil and that the word may be a seed planted in it, and may the word that is planted grow into beautiful fruit in our lives. Lord, may you keep me faithful to what you have said. We pray this in Jesus' name. So, we continue looking at this passage, and um, as I said, we've been looking at this for the past two weeks, and so um, to help those who haven't been with us for one of the weeks or both of the weeks, we're going to do a bit of a recap beforehand, just so we all know what is going on. So I'm going to quickly run through verses uh, 4 to 7, explaining what is going on there, what is the big message, what is the main thrust of this passage. So when we were looking at verse 4, we see this call here of Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. And this is not just an intellectual statement, this is not just a factual statement saying, yes, God is one, and we only know that there, we know that there is only one God. But what we see in verse 4 is a cry of allegiance. It is the cry saying there is only one God, and we only worship this God, no other. He and He alone is our object of worship and full adoration. We are, not, we are committed to nothing else the way that we are committed to our God. We are committed to nothing more than we are committed to our God. In verse 5, it just sort of emphasizes it all the more, this commitment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is not just a part of your heart that is committed. This is not just a part of your soul. It's not just a little bit of your mind, but it is all of it. All of it. The picture here is that the whole being, the whole person, body and soul and spirit, all committed to loving God. Not a part of who you are is not committed to loving Him. That is what this passage is pushing. It is saying to the people of Israel, and what the people of Israel are to confess is that they are gods. They are committed to Him wholly and before all else. With every part of who they are, their internal life, their personal life, and their public life. There is not a single minuscule place of the, who they are or what they are that is not committed to Him. Verses 6 to 9 expands on this. It's not only that they are to love God with all that they are, but to love Him in all of their existence. So we look at that, it says there, that you shall have these commands that I have given you on your heart. The commands that God has given, we'll see in chapter 5, or you will see in chapter 5 if you look at it, is the Ten Commandments. But what starts the Ten Commandments is not a commandment, but a reality of what God has done. He is the God who has brought you out of Israel. Now do this, 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 and this. So in the same way, verses 6 to 9, when they speak of you shall have the commandments on your heart, you shall teach them to your children, and they shall be as a mark on your hand and on your head. The point there, the thing that is meant to be there is not just these commandments, do, 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 but what God has done and what He commands us to do, that is what is meant to be on our hearts. That is what is meant to permeate our inner life, our personal life. And what we will look at today is meant to saturate our public life as well. What He has done and what He calls us to do. 
So what we looked at in the first week is that we are to have that in the life, that psychological life, that inner dialogue ought to be filled with the reality of what God has done and thoughts of what He has commanded us to do. And what we looked at last week, looking at verse 7, we are to love God with our personal lives, with our family lives, that our homes ought to be places where above all our children are educated on what God has done and how He commands us to live. Not only is that, but our personal lives and our relationships, our speech, our conversations ought to be saturated with talk of what God has done and how we ought to live in life. Now. Our interactions should be our words and our, our interactions and our communication should be this big overarching idea should be that we are talking about Christianity that forms part of our personal interactions with people. And we look at this passage up until this point. Now we'll look at continuing the big idea is this. That there is not a single square inch of our lives, of who we are, of our experience and our existence, but for which Jesus does not say that is mine. We cannot compartmentalize our Christian. We cannot say, it is this little <coughs> section here, here I do that, and everything else I live in another way. It saturates everything. Jesus does not say, I will have this little section you will give me, and I will not touch the rest. He says over all of it, it is mine. We cannot love God in our heart, but then live personal lives as if we do not know Him. We cannot live personal lives acting <coughs> as if we are holy. Loving God, talking about Him, but then our hearts are far from Him. It has to touch all of His parts. If our hearts are far from Him, then all the holiness in our personal lives is just pageantry and playing pretend. Jesus not only claims our inner life, our personal life, but what we look at today is that He claims our public life. Not only our heart, not only our soul, but all our might is to be committed. I think that's the big point that the Heidelberg Catechism we read earlier is making. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own. But I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior. And that last sentence there, he assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Because I belong to I am not my own. No part of my life, my identity is ultimately my own. We are His. And so our lives in private, in person, and in public belong to Him. And that is radically countercultural. That is radically against everything that the Disney movies and things that we grow up teach us. that you feel it even now within you, that that swims heavily against so many of the ideas that we take for granted, that I am my own. I should seek out my best life. I should live for me. I should do what I want to. That I am the hero of my life. That I need to find my best life now or do what is best for me. It swims against all of that. For I am not my own. And this week, we are looking at verses 8 and 9. So sort of round out, to finish this picture over the last three weeks, we have been looking at what a life lived for God looks like. So looking at verses 8 and 9. They describe what it looks like to worship God with all your might. What does it look like to worship God in your public life? What does it look like to love God in the world now? We've looked at what it looks like to love him in your inner heart, what it looks like to love him in your personal life, and this week we are looking at what it looks like to love him in your public life, in your interactions with the world. Verse 8. You shall bind them as signs, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What is this? What shall be binded on the hand? What shall be a sign on the hand and on the 
forehead, and what shall be written on the doorposts and on the gates. Again, it is that which we look back at in verse 5. It is the words that God has commanded them. To put it simply, it is what God has done to save his people and what he then commands them to do in response to that. That is what they ought to have as a sign on their hand, what ought to be as a sign on their forehead, written on the doorpost and on the gates. They are to bind them on their hands. To bind the commandments on their hands is to have the deeds of their hands reflect the reality of what God has done and what God commands them to do. They aren't actually supposed to write the Ten Commandments on their hands. That's not the idea there. It's symbolism. To have a hand that is marked by that sign is to have hands, is to have deeds that reflect that reality of what God has done and what He has commanded them to do. For Israel, this means living in a way that distinguishes them from the surroundings. As God's chosen covenant people, a people that belong to Him, their actions ought to reflect the reality that they are His treasured possession. <clears throat> and for you and for me, as God's people today, this means very much the same thing, that the deeds of our hands, the things that we do ought to properly portray to the world the gospel of Jesus Christ and the goodness of His way of life. That our actions in the workplace, in the shopping center, on the train, in the park, shout to the world of the glory and the goodness of Jesus and the gospel. And that we are His cherished possession. That our love for the poor, our joy in sorrow, our humility, our hope in the darkness, our love for the unlovable, our pursuit to be pure, our welcoming in of the outsider, may they always be before the eyes of the world. That our radical love for Jesus may us stand out, not for our glory, but for His. And the next thing that he says there in verse 8 is they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Again, the idea there is not that they are to write the Ten Commandments on their actual forehead. The idea here is that they should be as a mark on the forehead, that they should be the way that their thoughts are shaped. The same way as the mark on the hand is that their hands, their deeds ought to be shaped by what God has done and what He commands them to do. This says that their thoughts the way they think, their world view, the way they world, the way they view the world, ought also to be shaped by what God has done and by what He has commanded them to do. How we think ought like our deeds to be shaped by these things. And last week, some of you remember that we spoke about our children. And their thinking being shaped by the world and by all these various forms of media and things that they consume. That all of that is shaping them, changing their worldview, shaping the way that they think. And the reality is, as adults, we're not immune to that. We may have a couple more filters in the way and the process may be slower, but the same things still seep in. We are all influenced towards seeing the world the way that the culture does, defining what is right and wrong by what is contemporary, acceptable, rather than some sort of unchanging standard. We slowly, unknowingly, and uncritically begin to accept these things we hear repeated. We begin to accept them as true and right and never actually critically think about them in light of God's Word. Take, for instance, the idea that you can do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And face value, that seems like a statement that we can all agree on. But a deeper, more critical look at this sort of ethical position will show that at its core, it believes that the greatest good in the universe is the comfort and happiness of humanity. That what it assumes is that there is no higher objective moral standard than the feelings of people. It fundamentally assumes either that there is no God or that God's highest desire is just that humans are not hurt or uncomfortable. It is totally opposed to the Bible. That what is true, good, and beautiful is ultimately defined. 
defined by God, not what hurts the least amount of people. <coughs> or our feelings can sometimes be wrong. Something that is right is right, because God has said so. And what is wrong is wrong because God has said so. Even if our actions don't hurt anyone, if God has said it is wrong, then regardless of the consequences, it is wrong. See, because our way of thinking is constantly being shaped by the world, even when we don't realize it, we need to renew our minds. We need to keep the gospel daily before our eyes. So that our conform, so we can make, so we can inform our patterns of thinking and our worldview to the Bible. We need to let the Bible confront our ways of thinking, our confront ideas, and make we be open for them to be changed. So to bring together what it means to worship God in public life it is to conform our thinking, our worldview, to what He has said. His revelation. It is to conform the actions of our hands to what He has said. Part of this means that to have we are to have our opinions shaped by the Bible, not by Andrew Tate or Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or so forth or any other influencer. I'm not saying we cannot learn, we cannot listen, but whatever they say ought to be held up against the perfect standard of the Scriptures and where it is in conflict, it ought to be unequivocally rejected. That our primary influencer be the Word of God. And truly to be influenced it with, by it, we need to deal with it, we need to read it, we need to handle it. More than just for an hour on a Sunday. In the world we find ourselves in, this does mean risking being different. It does mean risking being offensive. But loving Jesus has always been risky and offensive. It has never been safe or comfortable. Thinking in line with what the Bible says today will most likely get you marked as a bigot or a homophobe or a transphobe or so forth. But the reality is that it is not driven by some sort of fear of these things, these things but a standpoint like that is driven by a fear of the Lord. This sort of brings us, now we're going down a loop, but we're going to Revelation, and it's going to be fun. So, we have all most likely heard of these passages. And this is to, to cover a bit of a few different things, but we've been looking at that if we are to conform our hands, the way that we work, the way that we do, and the way we think to the Word, then we are most likely going to end up on the wrong side of the culture. And that is exactly what the writer of Revelation, John, has to say. And so we're going to try and kill two birds with one stone here. We have most likely all read these passages in Revelation of the mark of the beast. The mark on the hand and the mark on the forehead. And that if you have this mark or without this mark, you won't be able to buy or sell. And people are afraid of microchips and barcodes and all sorts of things. <clears throat> so John in Revelation 9, 12, sorry, in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12 says this. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead and on his hand, he will drink the wine of God's wrath, pour with full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, those worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. So let's break this down a little bit. Where is the mark of the beast? On the hand? <coughs> On the forehead? Where are the people of God meant to be marked by his law? On the hand? And on the forehead? So this warning in Revelation it's not a warning that someday in the future someone's going to put a microchip in our hands or in our foreheads and without it we won't be able to use our post machines. That's not the point. It is not talking about that. What it is talking about is actually a bit more scary. 
Because it's not something in the future that might come we need to look out for, but it is something we need to look for in our lives now. You see, the mark of the beast on the hand is actions that are conformed to the way of the kingdom of darkness, that are deeds that are in line with the fallen world. To do what the world around us does, to live in no way different from the world and the sinful nature. That is for the hand to be marked by the sign of the beast. In the same way, the mark of the beast on the forehead is not a barcode. It is having your way of thinking conformed to the world, to the fallen sinful nature and not to the gospel. It is having a worldview shaped more by TikTok, Disney and Hollywood than it is by the word. So do not fear a barcode, do not fear a microchip, but fear a life lived in a way that is out of line with the gospel. Fear a way of thinking that is not shaped by what God has done and how he commands us to live. And again, there is a warning earlier in Revelation that for those who do not have the mark of the beast, they will not be able to buy or sell the ideas, they won't be able to live normally in society. It will be hard for them. And that is not so hard to imagine, is it? If you are not an ally, taking action to support certain ideologies about gender or sexuality, you may lose your job. You could be boycotted in such a way that normal life will be very hard. If you do not affirm the LGBTQ so forth ideology, if you do not think rightly about this according to the culture, you may say similar repercussions. For our actions to be in line with the gospel, for our thoughts to be conformed to God's word, means that we are not marked by the beast, but by the Lord. And it may be a short time before buying and selling, working, living as equal citizens in our world may be impossible if our hands are marked by the gospel and our thoughts are marked by the gospel. One thing we cannot do is to sacrifice truth on the altar of contemporary cultural acceptance. The church has believed something for over 2,000 years. If it is in line with scripture, we ought to be very cautious abandoning something like that. Especially if what we are abandoning it, abandoning it for looks an awful lot like the new ideas the world came up with 50 years ago. But we may be smeared, slandered, exiled for being different. But we may be called bigots, haters, degenerates, and so forth. Let our reasonableness and our loving nature in disagreement be a stumbling block before those who ridicule us. Let us not abandon the truth of God for the thoughts of men. Let all of our questions about the true, the good, and the beautiful begin with the question, what has God said? Before I make a judgment, what has God said? Before I come up with an idea, what has God said? Before I act, what has God said? summary, the way that we think and act in the public sphere should be marked and shaped by the gospel as is revealed throughout the Bible. In the same way, it should be written on our doorposts and on our gates that those who enter into our homes, that our homes may be seen as places where this truth has shaped it as well. So to conclude then, our worship of our Lord is all-encompassing all spheres of our existence. We are called to love Him with everything in all aspects of our existence, even though every, even through every action in your home, in your head, in public, every second of every day of our lives. And that is the minimum. That is the minimum. So the reality is, we have not loved God this way. If we are honest, if we are truly honest, 
Our inner world is more ruled by thoughts of Netflix, home care, and career progression than it is ruled by the gospel. If we are honest, we have not loved God and our families as we ought to and in our personal lives. We prefer family entertainment over family worship. We prefer a good time and chatting about the recent things than we do chatting about God. We have not valued His word highly enough. And that includes me. We have not got, loved God rightly in our public lives. Again, if we are honest in our public lives, we focus more on having our deeds approved by society and those around us than having them display the gospel. If we're honest, the way we think is shaped more by what is acceptable than by what God has said. But glory and honor and praise be to the God who has not saved us because we have loved Him rightly. Because we have loved Him with all our soul, all our might all our hearts. Glory be to the God who has loved us first. Glory be to the God who died for us while we were still sinners. That's the gospel. That Jesus died not because we loved God so well but because we did not. That Jesus Christ died for us while we were still sinners. <clears throat> the only person who ever loved God as we ought dies the death that we deserve, that we might enjoy His presence that we could never earn. That is the <coughs> Is this then an excuse to say, oh well, I can just keep on living a half hearted, weak Christianity? No. This is our motivation. This is the motivation that He died for me. He gave me grace when I had earned nothing but hell. He adopted me into his family when I was spiritually hopeless. He offered me a future hope and inheritance that's greater than my wildest dreams. That demands the love of all my heart, the love of all my soul, and the love of all my strength. That deserves that kind of love and adoration of my whole inner being, of my whole personal life, of my whole public life. That is our motivation. Not to do this so that God may love us, but to do it because He has loved us. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, our hearts ache knowing how poorly we have loved you. <coughs> light of how well and how perfectly you have loved us. Even when we did not deserve it, you loved us. Even when you deserved it, we did not love you. Lord, may our hearts find their joy and adoration in the fact that you have loved us so. May that be the driving force, may that be the fuel to the fire for lives lived with hands marked by your commands, with thoughts shaped by your commands, not because we must so that you will love us, but out of thankfulness for what you have done for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, offering today, we're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, at the end of the service, you